Welcome to XR, Extended Reality. What is it and how close are we to Ready Player One? So I decided to do this presentation as an introduction to XR and Extended Reality for people who were curious about it and weren't exactly sure what Extended Reality was or maybe what Virtual Reality, Augmented Reality, how does that fit into Extended Reality? And I decided that an easy way to try to explain everything is to compare it to uh, something that maybe you've seen before, which is the story of Ready Player One. Now, if you haven't seen Ready Player One, don't worry, I'll walk you through it and all the examples that I'm using. And if you haven't seen it, I should also warn you that there's going to be a few spoilers in this video for it. Now, XR stands for extended reality, but what is extended reality? Extended reality is all real and virtual combined environments and human-machine interactions generated by computer technology and wearables, also referred to as digital reality or immersive technology. So that's a bunch of jargon, so let's kind of break that down. By all real and virtual combined environments and human-machine interactions and generated... Okay, maybe it's easier to think of it as digital reality. It's digital landscape, digital items that are created in order to immerse the user in the digital experience and make it resemble reality or look like it is a part of reality. And we can do this with uh, computer technology like mobile devices, and we can do it with wearables like the VR headsets you've probably seen. So let's look at this Venn diagram that I created about XR technology try to give you an idea what the different aspects are and how they interact with each other. So 360 videos or 360 images are the uh, videos and images that are taken with either one camera and have several photographs stitched together or a 360 video camera. And what that does is give you an image that as you move around the technology, say your phone perhaps, you can see the entire 360 environment as opposed to a two-dimensional photograph. Virtual reality or VR is a completely immersive experience and augmented reality, which doesn't currently really interact with virtual reality, uh, is still a part of XR technology. And then mixed reality is a part of augmented reality, but not all augmented reality is mixed reality. Now, there are other XR immersive technologies, and you can think of that in, as the stuff that's in that orangey yellow space in the diagram. And sometimes it does interact with VR and AR and the rest of it, but not necessarily. Uh, one example is haptics, which is a wearable device that uh, simulates something that you might be experiencing in a digital environment like VR or AR, and it'll uh, give you kind of a sensory feeling on clothing. Surround sound you might be familiar with. Uh, just sitting in a movie theater, it might say, oh, this theater has surround sound. And basically that's speakers that are placed in various parts of the theater um, where the audio might come out in only one speaker to simulate that the audio is behind you or behind you to the right. And so the audio will only come out of the right speaker instead of having all the audio come out of every speaker. And it gives the person the impression that the audio is coming from one specific area. An immersive dome, uh, for example, if you've ever done the Harry Potter Hogwarts ride or the Spider-Man ride at Universal Studios, it's a giant dome that has a projected video on it. And depending on where you stand in front of it, uh, it looks like you're in that environment. The immersive cave is something similar, it's just more like a room as opposed to one giant dome. And then I also want to mention the visual production on The Mandalorian uh, because it's something similar to the cave. Uh, in The Mandalorian, instead of using uh, green screens where the actors stand in front of and you're probably more familiar with, what they did was they projected the environment on a number of LCD screens. So as the actors stand in the space doing their job, they're really in the space and they can really see where their characters are. Uh, and things can be added in post-production, but mostly it's, it's there and it's being recorded with the background already in place as opposed to a green screen. 
So let's take a look at the movie Ready Player One. I'm going to show you a part of the trailer that really shows what the virtual reality aspects of the movie are. A whole virtual universe. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do. But they stay because of all the things they can be. So that is Ready Player One. The main character is in a virtual environment where he can go and ride the DeLorean from Back to the Future and just wander around uh, in a virtual space while he's actually uh, in a van by where by his house. The movie came out in 2018. It was directed by Steven Spielberg and it's based on a book by Ernest Cline of the same name. And there is a part two if you're interested, but I haven't read part two yet. The movie is actually set in 2045 and it's considered a dystopian universe. The star is Ty Sheridan. He's the guy you see here in the trailer and his character's name is Wade Watts, and his online handle, or what you might consider his username, is Parsable, and everyone calls him Parsival, and you're going to hear me say Parsable a lot, referring to him. So I mentioned Parsival is in a virtual space, in a virtual reality, but what is virtual reality? Well, virtual reality is an experience taking place within a simulation. So in this picture, this person is wearing a VR headset. When you put on a VR headset, you're completely immersed in that experience and have absolutely no idea what's going on in the real world. You can't see the real environment anymore. You can only see the virtual space. He's even wearing headphones, so he's only even listening to the virtual environment. And unless he lowers the volume on the headphones or take them off, he won't hear what's going on in the real world either. And he's interacting with the virtual space with the controllers in his hands, and you can see what he's seeing in the monitor on the left-hand corner. That is a, a view of what he's seeing in his VR headset, and that is an Alienware computer, which, uh, funny enough, is the computer I'm recording this on. So a bit of a history lesson, I'm going to show you a video of VR in the 90s, because virtual reality has actually been around for a while. It's just taken a while before there was enough experience and enough advancement where more people could experience it uh, in their homes and not necessarily have to go out to an arcade, which may or may not even have these. Well, Hollywood's dream is John Waldron's nightmare. At least that's what he calls this virtual world made for two, a video game where the players are on the inside looking out. Those boys are here. I've got a joystick. That's I've got a helmet. That's right. And you just put the helmet on like that. Right. And of course, you see that you have a gun in your hand. And to fire the gun, you simply press the trigger. And I'll uh, get in and join you. OK. Come into my world, John. Linked by a computer that tracks our individual motions, Waldron and I are now both inside the same electronic world. There you are. Hi. Just look at the size of that visor. It's gigantic. So for the sake of comparison, let me show you a virtual reality game from 2017. This is Star Trek Bridge Crew. Are they charged? Warp coils charged. They Fantas are! They Fantastic steering, uh, Mr. Finn. <laughs> uh, I'm trying. Swing her to the left a bit, Taylor. Right, engage. This is a lot easier to control with VR. Mm. As I can do both hands. Right, tactical less scan system, please. We're showing on their sensors. Hostile oh, vessel well, that went well. Scan oh. red alert, raise shields. Oh, so straight in front. Shields up. The guy in the bottom right hand corner is wearing the VR device and he's viewing uh, this game, he's interacting with it. All the other people in it are other players, and now instead of doing this at an arcade, you can do this at home. All the other players are probably in their own houses and they can be all over the world. Avatars. So avatars don't just exist in the virtual space. You've, cre you've probably created your own avatar to play online games or just for fun, uh, to be your icon in social media, 
Uh, so you know, you know avatars. On the left here, we have the avatars from Ready Player One, Parcival's in the middle, and his friends who are uh, tuning in from all over the world, just like that board game. Um, those are their avatars as well. And uh, as you can see, the comparison on the right-hand photo to the Nintendo Wii from 2006. Now, when the Nintendo Wii came out, uh, we were all excited about being able to create our own avatars and having them look like us, or maybe like how we would wish you would look, or you know, just have fun with them. Uh, but you can see the, the difference is, is pretty big as far as uh, advancement. But that was 2006. You can compare the avatars from Ready Player One to this Ready Player Me, which is an online uh, social platform for a virtual reality chat experience. As you can see, they're starting to look more like the ones from Ready Player One. A close-up of Parcival's avatar, uh, you can see the, the, we call it meshing. Uh, these kind of shapes and lines on his face. And that's because 3D models that are created in computers are made up of a series of polygons to create the shape. That's not just virtual reality. Any 3D model that you might be seeing online from a museum or anything else, those are all created with polygons. You can see this video here that'll tell you a little bit more about that. 3D scans, as heavenly as they are, come with their own set of problems. Straight out of the 3D scanning software, they usually come out with a huge amount of polygons and just garbage geometry. This can cause problems down the road when Blender is getting bogged down with all that data. And you could totally just throw a decimate modifier on there and call it a day, but that doesn't really solve the geometry issue. So in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to automatically create low-poly, clean versions of your 3D scans with textures. So that was just to give you an idea of how 3D models are created with the polygons. Uh, that was a tutorial for the program Blender. So some of the VR technology that you may have seen, uh, Google Cardboard was probably the most accessible to everybody. All you really needed was your phone. And the Google Cardboard itself was about 5 to $15, depending on where and when you bought it. Uh, as you can see from the little image there, what Google Cardboard did was a person was supposed to look up a 360 video on their phone and then view it through Google Cardboard to give you a more immersive experience like you would in a VR headset. There's no strap for your face, you have to hold it up with your hand and there's no other controller or um, way to interact with what you're seeing. The only interaction is the person moving around, uh, moving their head back and forth and around to see the 360 video. The Oculus Go uh, and the Samsung Gear uh, did have some interaction. You have the headset that is now you can strap to your face and you had a controller where depending on what program you were using, you had a little bit more control, uh, a little bit more way to interact with the, the environment. The Oculus Go is a self-contained unit. It didn't need the phone in there, but the Samsung Gear was meant to be used with the Samsung phone. So now we get into VR technology that has dual hand interaction. So uh, you can see there are controllers, so the person in the VR can interact with, with both hands. And for that you have the Oculus Rift, then came the Oculus Quest, the HTC Vive came out pretty much at the same time as the Rift, and uh, so did the PlayStation VR. Aside from the controllers for both hands, the user can now stand and move around on their feet. Whereas previously with the Google Cardboard and the gear, and you know, even with the Oculus Go, uh, the person could be sitting down and doing VR. And you can still do that with, with Rift as well, but um, now we get into experiences that are even more interactive and have the users uh, get up and move around in the space. So the way you interact in VR is based on the controllers or outside sensors. The controllers for the Quest that you saw are being tracked by the headset and the HTC Vive has uh, sensors that you can mount on your wall. The Rift has sensors you can set on your table, uh, but they're tracking the controllers, not your hands. But there is possibility of uh, tracking hands that already exist. Uh, the example I have here is the Leap Motion from 2019. In this photo, someone has mounted the Leap Motion to uh, a VR headset. 
And the leap motion is just tracking the hand movements. Uh, no gloves, no uh, controllers, uh, none of that is necessary. In regards to VR computers, not every computer can run a VR application. You have to have a pretty high-end computer and most of them will run you about $2,000. Uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on if you're looking at creation as well as um, the viewing experience. Now the image on the left is the Oculus Rift. You can see that there's a wire that goes from the headset and it's going to go to that high-end computer that I mentioned. And you're, you're tethered to the computer and honestly you might trip over that wire since you can't actually see it when you're in a VR environment. When we do demos, one of the things that we're very conscious of is trying to make sure that the people don't trip over that wire. Now compare that to the image on the right, which is the Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest doesn't have a wire. The computer is in the headset and um, that's pretty amazing. So the, an Oculus Quest will run you three to four hundred dollars depending on how many gigs you want on it. Um, but it's a self-contained unit so you don't have to buy that two thousand dollar computer. You don't have to worry about it. All you need is the Quest. So let's jump back to Ready Player One and discuss VR and education. In Ready Player One, the, in the book, the name of the planet that has all the schools is called Ludos. Parsifal attends public school completely online in the Oasis, along with millions of other students. He uses the school-issued Oasis console, gloves, and visor. In the book, not every student is attending class online, but you kind of get the impression that most of them do, so much so that the school board is issuing these virtual devices to the students. In the, in the description for this video, I'll have a link to the PDF version of this presentation. There's some other videos that you can watch and articles uh, to learn more about VR and education. Now let me show you a video for Morehouse College. Uh, Morehouse College, uh, when COVID hit and everyone everything was shut down and everyone was attending work or school virtually when they could. Uh, I'm gonna say this had to have been in the works for a while, but students at Morehouse College were able to attend their classes in a completely virtual environment, kind of like how you see uh, in the Oasis uh, of Ready Player One. The war is escalated, and so the powers in Europe are escalated. to Westphalia. The campaign was already beginning to expose serious flaws in Napoleon's plan. I'm going to stop on the screen capture right here. So as you can see here, they have a bunch of avatars with uh, the names of the students on top. And as students are in virtual reality space, they're not seeing the other person the way we would be watching other students on Zoom during our virtual classes. They were actually in a virtual reality space. So they're seeing each other's avatars and the other students are seeing their avatars and they're attending class where the professor is presumably showing them slides, other videos, talking to them. So they're doing uh, an actual virtual reality online class the same way that Parsifal does in the book. If you click on the link for the PDF, uh, you'll have uh, other slides you can link to other videos uh, as well to learn more about how VR is being used in education. So here's a picture of Percival in real life with his uh, friends that he made in the Oasis. Now, since we're pretty close to Ready Player One as far as virtual reality and being able to uh, go to school in a virtual space, how much would this actually cost? Because remember, Parsifal is getting this equipment from his school. Now we're going to do the calculations with a virtual headset and the maximum amount of interaction. Since Parsifal does get gloves to interact with his VR space, we're looking at a VR headset with dual hand interaction. The Oculus Quest will run you about $300. That's the cheaper version with the lower amount of gigabytes. 
that leaves us free to not buy a $2,000 computer and lower the price. Now, times that by 15.3 million students that are currently in the U.S. Uh, between grades 9 and 12. So that comes out to almost $4.6 billion. Asterisk sign, that does not include the uh, cost of Wi-Fi, internet, all the bandwidth, the data that's going to have to be downloaded, and all the electricity that the families would be spending uh, if they were doing this from their house. No word on whether the school board in Rare Player One uh, subsidized that at all. And the reason I only calculated for students between 9th and 12th grade is because for the most part, VR headsets are not recommended for children under the age of 13. And in some cases, it's not even recommended for people under the age of 18. And I'll point out that Parcival's friend here, Sho, is 11 years old. He should not be using these VR devices, unless maybe in the future, in 2045, uh, they've managed to make it safe for children. So let's move on and talk about augmented reality. Augmented reality is an interactive experience of a real-world environment where the objects that reside in the real world are enhanced by computer-generated perceptual information. So let me unload that one. Uh, basically, with augmented reality, um, as opposed to virtual reality where the person is completely immersed in a different world and can't see the real world around them, with augmented reality, the person can see the real world around them and there is a digital overlay that uh, looks like it's interacting with the real world space, but only exists in whatever device that the person uh, is holding or whatever headset, AR headset that they're wearing on their head. The most well-known example of augmented reality is the game Pokemon Go. As you can see here from the picture, the person holding the phone who has downloaded the app and is playing can see a Pokemon on the street but if you look behind them, there, there's nothing there. It only exists within the application that this person is seeing through their phone. And anybody walking behind the person could see through the phone and see the Pokemon. But if they're not looking through the phone, there is no Pokemon there. It's just a digital overlay on top of a real existing space. Now to experience AR, uh, you do need the internet. Some AR apps can be used offline, but you do need to download them into your, your mobile phone or your, your tablet first. AR is primarily experienced through a mobile device or tablet currently. While there are AR headsets from Microsoft and Magic Leap, for most people, they're experiencing AR on their phone and tablets. And the vast majority of AR experiences are made for mobile devices. AR is app-based, so you download the experience into your device. And there are apps that are specifically to be able to create AR. So you can create AR experiences in programs like Unity and Unreal Engine, but there are apps that are made uh, so a little bit more user-friendly for people to create AR experiences. And AR experiences are interactive. So one aspect of AR can be additive sensory information. So that's kind of like the Pokemon Go. In the picture here, what we have is a T-Rex that is walking uh, towards this person on, on the street. Now the person on the street can't see the T-Rex. The T-Rex only exists in whatever mobile device that the person who took this screen capture is holding. They can see the T-Rex, they might see it move around, uh, but nobody else can see it. There is no T-Rex there. It is a digital image that only exists on the mobile device. There's also an image recognition overlay uh, possible. In the image in the left, what we have here is somebody is at a museum and there's a photograph displayed in the museum. So you download the AR app onto your mobile device and when you hold it up to the photograph, uh, the app recognizes the photograph and then it brings on this digital overlay that only the person holding the mobile device can see. In this case, what it does is brings up the same picture, but this time you can see the names of the people on the picture. That's not really there in real life. It only exists on the mobile device. Facial recognition technology can be part of AR. So the image on the left is from Snapchat, and you've probably seen this, if not on Snapchat, then maybe on Instagram and various other applications where 
The app is recognizing uh, the person's face. They can recognize their eyes, the nose, the mouth, and so forth. And then they put a digital overlay on the person's face. In this case, white in the eyes, red in the cheeks, and the guy is vomiting rainbows. Uh, but you can see there at the bottom, there's various things that he could choose um, to, to use as a digital overlay. So AR experiences are primarily a visual with one hand interaction. You have the phone that we discussed, you have the tablet that's doing similar thing to what was going on in the museum. And as I mentioned, there are AR uh, headsets available. In this case, this is a Microsoft HoloLens. I'll show you this video on the right where it's a museum and using AR, they are able to uh, bring this painting to life. The Museum of Art wanted to engage young visitors with their amazing portraits. Guru decided to bring them to life. Bonjour, I am Etienne René, Cardinal Potier de Gèvre. I was born January 2nd, 1697. And now the video on the left, uh, which is a magic leap application, uh, you can see that the person wearing the augmented reality device uh, can see uh, this digital, digitally created fire inside the, the, the room that they're training in. This is a, a training module that was created uh, for students. So that's a little bit about how AR is being used in education. So that video with Magic Leap brings us to mixed reality because Magic Leap is a headset for AR that is capable of mixed reality. What exactly is mixed reality? Remembering that mixed reality is a part of augmented reality. Mixed reality is the merging of real and virtual worlds to produce new environments and visualizations where physical and digital objects coexist and, in, and interact in real time. All right, let's break that down again. Using the image on the right, the person in it appears to be wearing a Microsoft HoloLens, which like Magic Leap can do mixed reality. There's a 3D image on the table of Maui, and then there's a green button on the wall with a chef hat, and presumably the flat screen uh, game that this person is watching is also only inside his headset and doesn't exist in real life. Okay, but what's the difference? Well, augmented reality lays a digital element over reality, but it doesn't interact with the space it inhabits. So on the left, uh, what we have here is the game Wizards Unite, which is similar to Pokemon Go. Uh, on the left, you can see I have my wand out. I'm gonna help this rooster escape the Neasel. Uh, you can see it kind of sitting you know, uh, standing on top of the floor, you have shadows, uh, but compare that to the image on the right. This is the same game, but in this case, the beast that I'm trying to free is sitting on top of my friend, um, part of her arm, part of the Starbucks cup. It's basically floating in air. It doesn't recognize that there are different elevations and depth in this image. Uh, my friend, the table, the Starbucks cup. So the image on the left where you can see the Neasel and the rooster standing on the floor is an illusion. It doesn't recognize that there is a floor there. Mixed reality has spatial awareness. So this image of the T-Rex standing on a desk, the T-Rex walks over to the end of the desk, looks over the edge, jumps, and lands on the floor. You can see it here in the video. It has spatial awareness. What's happening is when you put on and set up a Magic Leap device, it 3D scans the room, and then it stores the 3D scan inside the headset. So whatever app you're using in Mixed Reality, it knows where all the edges are. It knows where the walls are, any tables, chairs, and it can interact with that space accordingly. Here's an example of an MR app. This is Ikea Place. So when you're using this app, it scans the room so it knows what the dimensions of everything are, and then it can overlay this digital image of the furniture, but it has to know what the size of the space is or else it wouldn't be able to tell you how or if the sofa is gonna fit in it. 
Here is the Magic Leap device. It's a visual headset with uh, one hand interaction through the remote. Now the computer is part of the Magic Leap device. It is tethered to the headset with a cable, but the computer is something you can clip on to uh, your pocket or you can put a little strap on it like a purse and then you're free to walk around in the space. You're not tethered to a desktop computer like you might be in certain VRs. And here is the Microsoft HoloLens. Now, unlike the Magic Leap device, the HoloLens can recognize hand movements. Select a hologram or button within arm's reach by tapping it with your finger. This is how you interact with holograms nearby. So let's talk about technology between AR and VR because ultimately there is a very huge difference between the two and how they are able to do what they do. Now this is a breakdown of the Oculus Rift, but all VR devices have the same basic premise. They all use the LCD screen to give the person the immersive experience. There is an LCD screen at the front of this headset. Your eyes are about two or three inches away from it and everything else is a blacked out space. So the only thing you really see is the LCD screen. Now compare that to the AR, MR devices. Uh, instead of LCD screens, what they're using is projectors. Now remember, with the AR devices, with the HoloLens of the Magic Leap, you can see the real world behind you because the visor is some type of plastic or glass that you can see through. It's not blocking out reality. So how do you get to see the digital overlay? And the answer is projectors that are running to that screen that you, the person is looking through. Now, depending on the company, the projectors might be in different locations and might be working their magic slightly differently. But that's basically how AR goggles work. Here you can see a little bit of a close-up. Um, the VR headset has the LCD screens that are right through the viewfinder. And then on the right, the AR goggles have projectors somewhere on them, again, depending on the company, that are running, uh, that are projecting onto the visor that the person is seeing through. So let's go back to my Venn diagram of how VR and MR and AR are part of XR and talk about the intersection of VR and MR, which I don't have displayed on my uh, diagram because I don't think it really currently exists right now. So what would the intersection of VR and MR look like? So that would be a headset that could do both, right? But how would you be able to do both? They're running on different systems, LCDs and projectors. A device that's completely immersive and blocks out the outside world versus a device where you can see the outside world and have a digital lay on top of it. To try to answer that, I'm going to go back to Ready Player One. So this animated GIF is uh, part of the movie. Uh, the players are running in the game while they're running in the real world at the same time. Now, if the Oasis is a virtual reality experience and you can see the players in, I believe, what looks to be Halo avatars, um, they're in this virtual space. It's completely immersive. You've seen Parcival walking through it and riding on the DeLorean, but they're running in, in real time. Now, this is basically impossible because if they were in the virtual space, if they ran uh, in real life like that, they would run into traffic, they would run into a wall, they would run into other people. They have to be able to see the outside world in order to be able to do this. So this headset can do both. It has to. There's no other way. The headset that they use to access the Oasis has to be able to do VR and MR. They have to be able to see the virtual reality when they're playing in a safe space. But in order to run down the street like this, they have to be able to switch over to MR. As you can see in this close-up of Parcival when he's wearing the headset, you can see his eyes through the visor. So he is able to somehow be in a virtual immersive experience and then switch to 
a screen that's more see-through so he can see the real life uh, space around him. So are we anywhere near that? Um, I do have a few examples. The first one is Microsoft Dreamwalker from 2018. Now in this app, the person is in a fully immersive experience. They are in virtual reality. They can't see the real world around them at all. But the way the app works is it has, um, in this case, a map of the campus and it's able to guide the person through the campus and avoid uh, anything that might be in their way while creating this virtual environment that doesn't look like the campus and adds random people around it as well. Now, going back to Wizards Unite, there is an option for me to play this game in a virtual space. So here the man is kneeling down on the grassy knoll and about to pick up the remember all, but there is a button on the top left that I can switch to augmented reality. So now he's kneeling down on my living room floor and he picks up the remember all and I do the thing with the, with the wand and watch him go through the wall. Yep. So it's not mixed reality, it's still augmented reality, but I was able to switch back and forth from the virtual space of him uh, kneeling on the grass and then the most important elements that I'm interacting with for the game, when I switch it to AR, the man and the remember all appear in my living room. So the last one I'll mention is the Oculus pass-through. When you're setting up your Oculus to a play area to let the Oculus know what is the safe area in the room that you're going to be playing in, um, it sets up this mesh uh, for you that will come up if you're going too close to it. And the way it's set up, there is a low resolution camera outward facing on the Oculus. When you first put on the Oculus, you see this black and white grainy area. And then you walk around with the controller and you set up your space. Uh, but you see this grainy black and white footage inside the Oculus. So the camera is recording the outside reality and showing it to you on your LCD screen in real time, because if somebody passes in front of that camera, you're going to see the person passing in front of it inside the Oculus as well. We're here, we're playing with the Oculus Quest. First day, first night. And I don't see a lot of videos showing the pass-through camera, so I'm going to try to make a video like this without scratching the lens or touching it. But look. So perhaps this might be the first step to making that intersection between VR and AR a reality. So let's talk a little bit about health and accessibility with VR and AR, because there are a couple of concerns. One of the biggest health issues with VR is uh, headaches. Um, there's also motion sickness. I personally have motion sickness if I'm flying through the space. The disconnect between my brain knowing that my body's not doing anything uh, gives me motion sickness and, and gives me nausea. There's also eye strain. Remember that the LCD screen is basically two inches in front of your face. Now there haven't been a lot of studies of prolonged use of VR, it just hasn't been around and widespread enough for that uh, to be the case, but there are some articles that talk about it. And then VR does have an accessibility issue for people who uh, need corrective lenses. Most VR devices will fit over most glasses, but some glasses are too big and it's kind of uncomfortable. Oculus Quest does offer the possibility of having prescription lenses adapted into the device so you don't have to necessarily switch to contact lenses or for people who can't wear contact lenses. But one of the biggest issues with VR is the accidents. Because you're in an immersive space, you can't see reality around you and even with the play area set up, um, there are a lot of ways to injure yourself. This video is a compilation, the third compilation in a series that's just a bunch of people getting hurt in VR. I don't find this funny. When we're doing demos, we're trying to be very careful to make sure that the person who's doing the VR doesn't injure themselves. Yeah. 
You have 16 shots per round. Oh! So the good thing with the AR and the MR is that since the person is not fully immersed since they can see in reality, that's not an injury they never even think about. But AR and MR does have their own health and accessibility issues. This quote from Magic Leap straight up says that Magic Leap devices can't be worn over glasses. But the biggest health issue that is talked about with AR and MR is the um, warning for people who are prone to seizures. Since AR is even newer than VR, there aren't a lot of uh, studies about what the long-term effects are. So those are, that's the research is a little hard to find. So let's talk about some more areas of extended reality in regards to what we see in Ready Player One. Basically the yellow-orange area of the Venn diagram I made, things that can but don't necessarily have to interact with VR, AR, and MR. Let's start by looking at haptic clothing. Haptic clothing is wearable devices that simulate tactile sensations of virtual objects. The easiest way to explain it is with this clip from Ready Player One. What kind of haptics are you rocking? You got the gloves and full visor or full body? Can you feel this? Um, yeah. So I'm going to pause here for a second. With the haptic bodysuit, he can feel the sensation of her hands on him, even though he's only interacting with her avatar in the virtual reality space, and she's somewhere else completely. But not only that, from the image we can tell that it's also sensitive to a certain amount of pressure, if you can see, the fingertips are more visible than the rest of her hand. So this bodysuit must have sensors everywhere, and pretty good ones as well, because it can really tell how much pressure she's trying to put on him. Haptic body clothing is its a sensory-based system. Something occurs in the virtual space, and the wearable device reacts to it so a person can feel something physically, even though they're not really there. One of the methods that haptic clothing uses is vibrations. You may have experienced something similar if you're playing a, a video game, your controller might start vibrating in your hand in reaction to something that's going on in the game. So transfer that occurrence to clothing. A more common use besides vibration is force feedback. For that, the sensation instead of vibration, there's a, kind of like an air pocket that expands and contracts and makes you feel pressure wherever it is that you're wearing it. Ultrasound I'm not too familiar with. It's not really very common. It's a little hard to explain, but I have a link you can learn more about it. And then electrical simulation, kind of self-explanatory. It's kind of an electric shock as opposed to any vibration or force created by air. Haptic clothing can have motion capture. Uh, you might be familiar with motion capture from seeing behind the scenes on movies, people in full body suits with little white dots or white balls all over the suit. Other possible additions are climate control systems, which exist currently for people who are wearing costumes that are uh, very warm and they need a cooling system. And another possibility to add would be biometrics. We already have wearable devices that read our biometrics, our, the Apple Watch, uh, Fitbit. Uh, so those are all things that could be incorporated into haptic clothing. So I mentioned a bit about motion capture, but I want to show you this clip from the behind the scenes of Ready Player One. And I want you to pay attention when they talk about the headgear that they're wearing boots with head cams and dots all over our face so that they can record our facial performances and put those on our avatar, animate us, and create a virtual world around us. So I'm going to buzz in here for a second, because in the movie Ready Player One, when the characters are talking to each other in the virtual oasis, they can see each other's facial expressions. And as you can see here from behind the scenes, that is something that they can do even though the headgear required is incredibly complicated looking, but they are reading the actors' faces and making sure that the digital CGI characters 
are carrying those facial expressions. Currently, we do have haptic clothing, even if it's not as advanced as it is in Rare Player One. On the left, you see a haptic glove from the company Haptex, and on the right, you have a full body suit from Tesla suits, no relation to the car. And you can get an idea here of where the sensors are placed in these devices. To quote the company Haptex, we're totally committed to our founding vision of fully immersive Ready Player One style VR. And the right hand side for VR glove, feel real forces, not vibrations. Haptic bodysuits are also something that exists now. Uh, you can see you can get a full bodysuit, or for a cheaper price, you can get a partial bodysuit, vest only. Now, the omnidirectional track. On the left hand side, you can see Parsival in his van where he accesses the oasis, and he's standing on an omnidirectional treadmill which means instead of teleporting through space with the remote control, he's physically moving on a treadmill forward, backward, side to side. On the right hand side, you can see we already have omnidirectional tracks available. This, this honestly looks like something that came straight out of uh, Ready Player One. Yeah, exactly. Like you can use it at your home, you can experience the game, you can... You can step into the virtual reality oasis from your, from your home. Omnidirectional treadmills and tracks have been around for a while. On the left hand side you can see an arcade in China. Now they're doing a virtuality experience, several people at the same time. They're standing on an omnidirectional track um, and there's a like a device that's basically holding them as you saw in the previous video so they don't get hurt. On the right hand side is a screen cap from Ready Player One. This is the IOI War Room, IOI being the evil company. And as you can see, they have many of these omnidirectional tracks and they have also the, the holder the, that holds the person there um, for safety, I'm guessing also. And they're all using these devices simultaneously in the same space, virtually and in reality. CyberShoes is a startup company but it offers an alternative to the omnidirectional treadmill, which as you saw is pretty big and intrusive and probably not something most people could have in their houses. Cyber shoes, however, you could theoretically just throw under your bed when you're done. Once the shoes are charged, you've got your bar stall up and running and you've installed all your software. Now it's time to play some games. So now I'm going to get into holograms and this is the last piece of technology from Ready Player One that I'm going to talk about a lot. And that's because when I was watching the scene, I wasn't really sure what the technology behind this could be because all the technology in Ready Player One seems to be based on something in reality. So the scene starts and it's Parsival with the headset and he's basically calling in to the office of Sorrento, who is the bad guy in the movie, and he works at IOI. Now, instead of Parsival going into a virtual reality space, he's actually going directly into the real-world physical space of Sorrento's office. You can see here his avatar is being created in the space. He passes his hand through and it dissolves and then once he moves away, that light beam recreated him. So very important right there. Sorrento takes off his Oasis virtual reality glasses. He's in his you know big virtual reality chair, uh, but he takes off the glasses and now he's gonna talk and interact with Parcel's avatar within his office, even though he's not wearing any type of VR AR device, which means that Parcival is existing in this space and anybody who walks into his office can see him. Another thing to note, the camera is looking at Parsival from the side. Sorrento is looking at him from the front. We as the audience can see his side and presumably Sorrento can see his face. That means that Parsival is a 3D model existing in this space. So Sorrento gets up out of his chair and starts walking around the office and Parsival's avatar starts falling around. As he does so, you can kind of see where the light beams are coming from. 
that are recreating him as he walks around in the space. And again, Sorrento isn't wearing any kind of device that would allow him to see Parsifal in a digital reality. Parsifal's avatar exists in that reality and it's being created by some kind of laser and light beams. You can see something similar in the movie Blade Runner 2049, which funny enough is set just four years into the future further than Ready Player One. Would you read to me? It'll make you feel better. You hate that book. I don't want to read either. Let's dance. Compared side by side, you can see in Ready Player One, there were things in the office that were creating Parsifal uh, with light or laser beams somehow. Similarly, in Blade Runner, there's a computer track on the ceiling that flips with her as she walks and basically just creates her digitally. Ryan Gosling isn't wearing any kind of devices uh, that we know of anyway um, on his person to be able to see an overlay like you would with AR goggles. Usually when people talk about holograms, they're talking about something that's called Pepper's Ghost. And I'll let the person in the video explain it. What we do is, uh, it's a patented technique. It's the same technology that did Tupac at Coachella, right? Uh, it's a 200 year old uh, technique using 21st century uh, technologies. It's really not 3D, it's a two dimensional image that's projected in a specific way using angled reflective material that is invisible and high powered projectors or high powered LEDs that is projecting video uh, with black backgrounds that gives the illusion that you're looking at a live person standing on a stage in a three dimensional space. This is the behind the scenes of Pepper's Ghost using the example of Tupac at Coachella. As you can see in the diagram, the projector is projecting to a reflector, which is being reflected on a transparent foil. And then behind all that was Snoop Dogg singing. So from the point of view of the audience, it looked like Tupac was dancing on stage with Snoop Dogg. But that is the only angle that this works at. If you were standing on the side of the stage, behind the stage, above the stage, you wouldn't see the illusion because it's a two-dimensional image direct on a plane. It's not a 3D model existing in space, as you saw in the videos for Ready Player One and Blade Runner. To quote the science world, in a Pepper's Ghost illusion, when a real or recorded image is reflected in a transparent screen at a 45 degree angle, Viewers see a reflected virtual image that seems to have depth and appear out of nowhere. Real holograms are 3D images created by interference of light beams. In this article from 2015, most reports are realistic about the fact that projecting a coherent 3D image into midair remains an impossibility. So if you were wondering how far away we are from that in Ready Player One, there you have it. And yet, Brigham Young University started the Princess Leia project based on probably the most famous hologram ever seen in media. During the scene, R2-D2 is projecting a hologram of Princess Leia in her message to Obi-Wan Kenobi. As the camera moves from the point of view of the audience to the point of view of Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, we can see Princess Leia's back, we can see her face, we can see her turn around when she hears somebody behind her, and all of that is projected from R2-D2. I'm going to stop here for a second to point out something. When we see Princess Leia's hologram, we're seeing a hologram of herself, her person, as opposed to in Ready Player One and Blade Runner, where we were seeing a hologram of a digital 3D avatar uh, and a digital 3D AI projection. That's very different because the 3D model of these avatars and how they move and what they look like and so forth is already a digital file. The difference here is that since Princess Leia is an actual real person and not a digital creation, that means that to create that, 
you would need a volumetric scanning or recording system. Now that's more than we're going to cover in this video. That's one of the reasons I was focusing on Ready Player One so I could actually focus on a few things and not go into the myriad of things that are possible in XR. Uh, but just to put a little pin on volumetric recording. So let's go back to the Brigham Young University researchers and uh, find out how they're doing on that Princess Leia project they're working on. This is not unlike the effect you'll see with a sparkler. If you move it quickly enough, it doesn't look just like one point, it looks like a line. We can think about this image like a 3D printed object. A single point was dragged sequentially through all of these image points to create this 3D image in space. This display is like a 3D printer for light. You're actually printing an object in space with these little particles. This is not a hologram. We've demonstrated here that we can see it from the front, we can see it from the back, and in reality we can see it from almost any angle. Here we see the culmination of three years of effort. Our display is projecting to small particle focused right here. It's being dragged up and down vertically rastered, this image of Princess Leia. Now that research said it wasn't a hologram, but it fits the description from scientific world, so I don't really know what to say about that. I only recently found out that I've been using the word hologram incorrectly, but maybe I wasn't. Either way, what they did with Princess Leia there was said to be impossible, but we're still a very long way from getting to where they are in Ready Player One. The last example I have for you is volumetric display. Now, you just heard me say the word volumetric probably a minute ago. So here's an example of something like that. More than a hologram, Star Wars inspired tech you can buy right now. You can tell a great work of science fiction when fantasy tech inspires real tech decades later. That's the story of the VX-1 from Voxon Photonics. Inspired by the game Dedrick, also known as Hollow Chess, aboard the Millennium Falcon, this piece of real sci-fi tech is much more than a hologram. The VX-1 is what's known as a volumetric display. That means that, like Princess Leia's call for help and the game of Dedrick, it's a 3D image that can be viewed from any angle, without the need for special glasses or headgear. So that sounds like exactly what we were talking about, which is a hologram that you can view without any kind of headgear or mobile device to make it happen. But let me show you what that really looks like. So the device, so the hologram is being displayed in a pretty small device. But looked at another way, it could be that Sorrento's office was kind of one giant volumetric display case. I don't know what it would look like if I was inside that little bubble. So maybe that is where it's going. So with that, let's do a quick review. The image on the left is an artist's rendition of Parsifal sitting in his van while he's on the Oasis. As you can see, his headset and his gloves actually have wires that are going to the computer. If we were going to buy all of these devices so we could live inside a virtual world and attend classes and so forth, well, we'd need a headset gear. Currently, the Oculus Quest is $300 for the cheapest version, and if you were going to do an AR MR device, that's going to be a few thousand on top of that. So definitely what we need is a device that can do both. The haptic bodysuit with gloves will run you $6,500 currently, but that's for the higher end stuff. You can get just the gloves or the gloves with the vest. The cyber shoes over the omnidirectional track will run you another $400. And then if you really wanted a hologram device, then the volumetric display is currently a staggering $10,000. And again, asterisk. That does not include the cost of Wi-Fi, electricity, bandwidth, any of it. So what is the future of XR? Let's go back to the initial Venn diagram that I made. If you remember, we were really talking about where do VR and AR intersect. The future model and my hope is that there will be many interactions within these circles. 
And it's really fun to think about what that might look like in the future. For the future of XR, if we want to get to Ready Player One, we need to improve the existing tech. Because we have most of it, um, but not to the level that they have. And we need to bring the cost down. Remember, in Ready Player One, most people had access to the Oasis at varying levels. We definitely need improvements to the haptic gear that we have. Um, we just currently don't have the sensitivity that the ones displayed in the movie do. We definitely need a headset that can do both VR and AR MR. And we definitely need to improve how we do 3D holograms. That's the technology that is lagging the most behind if we're going to do a comparison to this story. So last thing, if you click on the PDF link that I'll have in the comments, you can uh, see the entire presentation in a PDF format and click on the links to all the articles and all the videos that I've included here. So that's it. Uh, thank you for watching this video and if you stuck around to the end, that's amazing. I hope you learned something, you can take something from this and that you have a better understanding of extended reality. So thanks again and it's okay, you don't have to like and subscribe.